Uh, welcome, a good morning, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I am uh, pleased to um, uh, welcome uh, Chairman Shabbat of the House uh, Small Business Committee. Uh, Chairman Shabbat has served Ohio's first congressional district since uh, 1994, and he has, since he became a member of Congress, served on the Judiciary Committee, the Committee on uh, Foreign Affairs, and perhaps most importantly for today, the Committee on Small Business, which he chairs. Um, we're going to uh, do this as follows. We're going to have uh, some brief opening remarks in which um, the chairman will outline the House Republican plan to provide regulatory relief to small businesses. Then we're going we're to sit down and chat a little bit uh, both about um, the, this session's legislative accomplishments so far, which are surprisingly many uh, eight days in. And then we will discuss the sort of broader outlook for small business uh, policy. Uh, and after that, we'll do uh, a Q&A. We're uh, going to try and end here at 945. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. We appreciate you all being here this morning. And uh, we certainly appreciate the great work that uh, AI has done uh, over the years. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, apologize for being just a couple minutes late. Um, I also, uh, as you mentioned, Stan, I'm going to try to keep my remarks uh, brief, and then we have a kind of a conversation and then question and answer. And um, one of the main reasons I keep my remarks brief is because the experience I had some years ago, I learned my lesson. I spoke in my daughter's uh, class. I think she was about in the first grade at the time. It's one of these bring your dad to class, tell him about your job kind of things. And after I got done talking to these little first graders, this little girl came up to me, and she was just a little thing. And she looked up at me and she said, sir, that's the worst speech I ever heard. <laughs> I learned my lesson uh, then. And um, my daughter wanted to cheer me up. So she came up to me and she said, dad, don't worry about her. She just repeats what all the other kids say. So, uh, but next week, uh, President-elect Trump uh, is going to give his inauguration speech on the west front of the Capitol. It used to be on the east front up to Ronald Reagan. He wanted to look out west towards California, so they moved it to the west front. We've done it uh, there since that time. Um, and he's going to tell the country what uh, he hopes to accomplish and what he hopes Congress to work on for the next four, maybe eight years. Um, and while folks have been speculating about uh, how this speech is going to go and where he's going to take the country, Congress has actually, as Stan mentioned, uh, been pretty busy in a relatively short time since we just got sworn in on the 3rd. Uh, we've passed some legislation, a lot of his regulatory reform relief, which I know we'll uh, get into here shortly. Um, and uh, it, when I was thinking of the inauguration speech, uh, it reminded me uh, of, uh, we may have some Thomas Jefferson fans here. I certainly uh, am one. But in his first uh, inaugural address, something that, that he said, um, Jefferson uh, uh, happened to be uh, an alumnus of, of my alma mater, uh, William and Mary. Um, I think you're a Harvard man. Harvard was, uh, uh, I believe, the oldest college university, and William and Mary is second. And we've had some pretty distinguished uh, alumni over the years. Uh, uh, George Washington went there, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, John Tyler, Steve Shabbat. That gets a big laugh back in my district when I say that. But, uh, but great school, enjoyed it tremendously. And in the inaugural address, uh, Jefferson uh, said this. He called for a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. Of course, this was way before it was trendy to talk about small businesses. After all, virtually all businesses all across America uh, were small businesses back in 1801. But in 2017, small businesses are a really big deal. Um, even though by definition, they're relatively small. Usually, uh, under most of the federal regulations, it's up to about 500 employees. But two-thirds of the new jobs created in the American economy nowadays are created by small business. About half of the American workforce in the private sector are employed by small businesses. So they're really a big deal. Um, and Jefferson's concerns about who would regulate businesses and how much that cost uh, would have on workers, it was very prophetic. Um, federal regulations aren't just cutting 
workers and, and their bread, but it's actually affecting and cutting their jobs as well. Um, last week, I began my second term as chair of the House uh, Small Business Committee. I've been on the committee for 20 years. Um, I've stayed on the same committees intentionally. I'm also on Judiciary and Foreign Affairs. I was for six years the chairman of the uh, Constitution Subcommittee on Judiciary. Uh, I served as chair on Foreign Affairs of the Asia and Pacific Committee and uh, the, uh, uh, is, and the uh, Middle East Committee uh, as well. But I've stayed on these committees intentionally, and I've been the ranking member under Nadia Velasquez and now the uh, chair. Uh, and we actually have a very good working relationship on, on that committee. Uh, Nitty and I work together very, very closely, and, and uh, I wish a lot of the other committees, you know, followed in that uh, theme, but it doesn't happen in Congress too often. But um, we know one of the greatest, and, and I see this all the time, one of the greatest problems that small business face in this country is over-regulation. We hear it in hearing after hearing after hearing. I hear it from small businesses back in my district, but we hear it from small businesses all across the country. It's consistent feedback that we get that we need to reduce the amount of regulations that small businesses have to deal with, and that's what we intend um, to do. And our speaker, uh, Paul Ryan, got us all together uh, last year. Uh, and. We met with our constituents. We talked with each other. We actually put together an agenda. We didn't know who was going to win uh, the presidential election. We didn't necessarily have exactly uh, the same, same agenda uh, that, that uh, uh, now soon to be President uh, Trump had. Uh, but we put together, I think, a very strong agenda called uh, A Better Way. And some of the main things uh, that I was particularly pleased with was the amount of uh, regulatory relief that was built into this uh, a better way. Um, and over the last eight years, I would I would argue that the Obama administration has really gone on a regulation uh, rampage, um, hitting us from all angles, both from the bureaucracy through executive orders, a whole range of things. Um, they're telling you know small businesses uh, what kind of refrigerators they can have, what kind of light bulbs that businesses can use, and even how much uh, employers have to pay their employees in overtime. The overtime rule uh, is probably one of the most talked about things that we've seen in the Small Business Committee over the last uh, year or so. Um, President Obama's regulatory overreach it really has been historic, not just in terms of the number of regulations issued, but in the cost to the economy. It's been estimated, some studies have shown, that it's about uh, $100 billion, at least a year, uh, in additional costs to the American economy. That means fewer job creations. That's probably um, you know, why we've seen uh, the, the number of jobs, whereas it has increased, we haven't seen the growth in the economy that would have been expected after a recession of the magnitude that we uh, have gone through. Um, so that, that has been a, a, a huge problem. Um, and it's estimated that about $11,000 per year to small businesses all across the country, an additional $11,000 in regulatory costs for every employee that they, that they have. And that's a cost that just can't be borne by the small business community. And when they're looking uh, for ways that, uh, uh, to grow the economy, we, we actually have, you know, the, the better way that I mentioned, it's our to-do list. Um, and I had introduced uh, two bills when this Congress came back into session. Now, these are bills that we've worked on over the years, so they're not new. They've gone through the committee process. We're going through regular order, but introduced uh, a couple of bills that I'll just mention briefly. We'll probably go through more in our uh, discussion period. But one uh, is the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, uh, which I think is going to have a real positive effect if we can actually get it uh, to the finish line, which I think we will this time. Uh, one reason, uh, Mike Pence, who uh, is a, a good friend of mine, Mike and I uh, went through campaign school together back in 1988. Yes, there is such a thing. Um, it's only over a weekend, and we both lost back in 1988. And I finally won in 94 in the revolution, Newt Gingrich, a contract with America. Just saw Newt yesterday, by the way. He was speaking to the uh, Conservative Opportunity Society yesterday. And uh, so it was, it was nice seeing Newt again. But I came in in 94. And then uh, uh, Mike came in, uh, I believe, six years later and, and served for about eight years. But my reason for bringing Mike up is that he was a co-sponsor of the Regulatory Flexibility uh, Improvements Act. We were also on the same three committees, Judiciary, Foreign Affairs, 
uh, and, and small business. So we're going to have an ally uh, who clearly is going to have uh, the ear of, of President <coughs> soon, uh, uh, Trump. So a lot of these things that we've talked about for a long time, um, I believe we're actually going to be able to uh, implement into law, which I think are going to benefit small businesses uh, all across uh, this country. So I think at this point, maybe we can go into the sure. conversation and then the questions. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for thank you for setting that that sure. broader uh, context. The the first thing I would uh, I wanted to ask you is to uh, tell us what this looks like in in concrete legislative terms. Mm -hmm. So last night the the regulatory flexibility improvement act. Uh, passed the House, the HALOS Act uh, passed the House earlier this week. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about those two initiatives and what they what they mean for the business environment? Why you think they're so important? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe give a couple examples. Sure, of sure. Yeah, the, the, the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act we passed just last, last night. Uh, it's something that many of us have worked on uh, for years. We had introduced it, I introduced it in the last Congress. Uh, it's bipartisan. Uh, we have quite a few uh, Democrats, I think 73 uh, proc uh, 73 voted against it. I think they were all Democrats, but uh, we had a, about an equal number of vote with us on that. So it was it was clearly bipartisan legislation. And in essence, what it does um, is the Regulatory Flexibility Act, which was passed you know back in 1980 or so, uh, set up certain rules that have to be followed when new rules or regulations are going to be imposed by the bureaucracy. What this does is it says that from now on again, assuming we can get this uh, across the finish line, so we have to get it through the Senate. It would say that uh, that we have to, the bureaucracy is going to have to uh, do an, more or less an environmental impact statement, but it's an impact statement that, as to how this affects directly uh, small businesses and indirectly and cumulatively, because a lot of times the regulations have a cumulative effect. There's so so many of them, so they actually have to do an impact statement um, uh, showing the direct and indirect impacts on small businesses all across the country. Um, and they do this in about eight percent of the regulations that are passed right now. So it's a very small number. Um, so we think that's going to be very helpful to actually consider in advance how small impact, how small businesses are going to be impacted. Uh, the HALOS uh, Act, and, and HALOS uh, stands for uh, Helping Angels, um, Helping Angels uh, Lead Our Startups. We always do these things, so it's hard to remember what the heck they... <laughs> But in any event, the U.S. Um, Patriot Act is a good one. Yeah, the, exactly, yeah. exactly. And and the idea there is right now on university campuses, in investment clubs, in uh, nonprofits all across the country. Um, what what they have they have these expos where they try to get angels or investors together with entrepreneurs and and startups. Um, well, the uh, the SEC has come out with new regulations. Uh, which are going to require people who come to these things uh, to go through an, an accreditation uh, process. Very detailed. You have to bring bank statements and, and uh, tax statements and all this kind of stuff. So you're basically, it's going to be so daunting that people just won't come and they won't serve their purpose, which is to bring people that have money, angels, together with people who need money, entrepreneurs, to get uh, these startups off the ground. Because as you all know, access to capital is really critical. So that's what this HALOS uh, Act will do. It will push back on that regulation uh, and say that you, you don't have to do this uh, paperwork intensive process uh, which will keep these folks together. Now, if somebody's going to invest, they still have to go through that process to make sure that people aren't, you know, being... Uh, uh, Try to make sure it's infor informed investors. That's right, informed investment, exactly right. So th those are the two, and they both passed. We passed the one last night, the, the one prior to that, uh, and uh, they both passed with pretty good margins. And we're hoping we can get them through the Senate. We hope we can get them to the president's uh, desk and get them signed into law. On the broader um, issue of access to capital, where do you where do you see things going there and in the banking sector, especially? Mm -hmm. What do you? Well, our goal is, and uh, Jeb Hensferling would probably be able to give you, uh, you know, the, the most uh, the best insight on this. But we got to get rid of Dodd Frank. Um, it's awful. Uh, it's like a wet blanket over the economy. Um, 
something that was done in reaction uh, to the economic meltdown that was supposed to affect the so-called uh, too big to fail banks has affected community banks and uh, credit unions all over the country. And those are the folks that small businesses tend to get their loans from. So the regulations that are affecting these big entities uh, are, are killers at the small entities. It's been estimated that we're losing uh, nationwide a savings and loan or a credit union in this country now every day. And that makes access to capital that much uh, tougher. Um, so we ideally we'd like to repeal it, get rid of it. Um, realistically, uh, significant dramatic changes, um, but hopefully, Repealing it again, we need Senate help. And, and in my view, this is going to be. I do a, a blog on my political site uh, every, every week. I've been doing it for seven or eight years now. Um, and uh, and just yesterday, I talked about what I think will be the greatest threat uh, to the success of the Trump administration. Uh, and it's not China, and it's not Putin, and and it's probably not Iran or North Korea. It's the United States Senate. Uh, their rules, the the rules of the filibuster and requiring 60 votes. Um, it's going to be a challenge in, in the Senate on a whole lot of the things that, uh, that President Trump will, uh, will want to do. And uh, most of the, I think, folks up here who, who understand the process and, and uh, are familiar with that challenge, but a lot of folks across America uh, have, have no concept of that at all and figure, well, Republicans are in the majority in the House and the Senate, and they got the president, they can do, pretty much do what they want. Uh, that's not the case. So we, we need, we're going to need some help. Talking about the Senate and its, um, and its procedural steps, uh, yesterday it said its first step toward um, Obamacare repeal in some uh, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's going to touch upon the individual and small uh, group market in, in important ways that will, mm -hmm. that, will, uh, that will affect small businesses. How, how do you envision the, the future there for the small group market? Mm -hmm. the, the shop exchanges have, you know, um, I think not performed in the way that people right. <laughs> hoped. No. How, do you, how do you see that um, going forward? Well, the shop exchanges have not, uh, as you indicated, <laughs> gone the way they had been uh, uh, projected to go. I think it's fewer than 1% uh, are, are involved in that and they're too yeah. expensive and the coverage you get just isn't what it needs to be. Um, and uh, obviously, what, what's happening right now um, is we have to we have to go through the reconciliation uh, process in order to be able to uh, repeal uh, uh, Obamacare, and then we have to get some Democratic support in all likelihood to be able to replace certain things, and that's a challenge. And we're seeing uh, that process playing out right now. But the goal is is to is to transition from Obamacare, which many have called the uh, the, the mother of all regulations uh, that have harmed small businesses across America to a more market-based uh, uh, competition uh, choice for those uh, as to which policy makes more sense. Uh, and, and there's a whole range of things that we're talking about doing, allowing insurance companies to sell their products across state lines to increase the competition and bring uh, prices down. Uh, health savings accounts, uh, tax credits, a, a whole range of things. Now, there are a number of, of bills that are out there right now, um, and the exact timing on this and how long it's going to take r remains to be seen. But right now, the Senate is, is we have to pass a budget in order to reconcile um, the repeal to that budget. And uh, uh, you start talking about this stuff back home and people's eyes glaze over, but it, it's important and we need, to, we need to do it, and that's what's happening right now. Reconciliation is not the best term to, uh, to <laughs> no, use in casual not. conversation. Um, before opening it up to the, to the room, I wanted to, I wanted to ask if you could speak briefly about tax reform and specifically on the, the intersection or overlap of reform on the individual side and the corporate side, mm -hmm. which for, especially for many small businesses is Yep. It's very important right, because you can choose your right. um, you know, corporate form and things like that. Well, last year, one of the things that I heard a lot was uh, that the, some folks thought, well, we, we need to reform the business tax code. The other folks thought we needed to f focus on individuals, and other folks thought we needed to do both at the same time. This was uh, now ultimately. Uh, 
uh, President Obama was still in the White House, so we knew the likelihood of getting anything again across the finish line was slim to none. So most of it back then was was kind of theory. Uh, now, you know, we're shooting with real bullets. I mean, it's real now. We, we may actually finally get tax reform done. Um, and I think in general, now we don't know for sure what's going to happen. We've worked closely with uh, Kevin Brady, our new, uh, relatively new uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee on this, and it's a big deal to him, obviously, and will continue to be. Um, but I think overall you're going to see, uh, you're going to see a, 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 a reduction in rates on virtually everybody, and in, in order to pay for those the rate reductions, whatever they may ultimately uh, be, you know, we've heard 15 percent, we've heard 10 percent, you know, 20 percent, et cetera, but something smaller, um, something lower uh, in exchange. The way you pay for it uh, is is probably going to be to reduce or eliminate, you know, most uh, deductions, credits, and, and that kind of thing, loopholes. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be some formula like that, and I think it'll probably affect both businesses uh, and, and individuals, which I think it should. And we got to do something about the corporate tax rates, which are we have the highest corporate tax rate in the United States in the industrialized world. And, and it used to be Japan, we were second, but then they lowered their rates, and now, <laughs> now we're at the top. And no, right. we're the United States of America. You know, that's something we well, shouldn't be at the top. So let's fix that. Well, got America first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see if we uh, can take a few questions from the room. Vincent Storymons. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman uh, Shabat and Stan. Um, Vincent Storymons of the Embassy of the Netherlands here in DC. Mm -hmm. um, the Netherlands is, is one of the large investors here in the US. I think we are number four or five. Mm -hmm. uh, that's done through companies like Shell, Philips, Heineken, but also our SMEs are investing here in, in the US economy. And I was wondering, you spoke of the legislation that is now uh, passed or is, is being passed. Uh, are there any specific provisions uh, or, um, yeah, well, provisions, I would say, for foreign investment, uh, which is also, I think, important for the US economy to, mm -hmm. uh, to grow? So maybe you can speak on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're, we're very, uh, uh, very enthusiastic about foreign investment in the United States. Um, it's critical. I know in, in my district in Cincinnati, we've got a, a whole range of, of companies that are owned by not necessarily U.S. entities, and we think it's wonderful. We encourage them uh, to come to uh, Cincinnati and elsewhere to the country. Um, m most of those things will be covered in uh, the, the, the legislation, the tax legislation that we're going to be working through. I, to maybe expound upon your, your question a little bit, I think trade is going to have to be an important part uh, of the agenda in, in improving uh, the economy in, in this country, too, especially with small businesses. Um, because 95% uh, uh, of the consumers on this globe live outside the borders of the United States. Um, and only 2% of small businesses sell their products on the international market. So there's huge room for growth. Um, although 98%, this is kind of an odd figure, but 98% of, of trade uh, is from small businesses. So it's, the statistics seem inconsistent with each other. but. If you look them up, they're, they're the case. But my point is, despite some of the language that we heard during the campaign, you know, about you know, more or less building borders that might try to keep trade out and investment in the United States, I don't think that's the direction that, that we're going to go, because it just doesn't make sense. That's very, very sure. Let's go here, a third row on the right. That's you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and thank you again to you for your presentation. Sure. Um, Chris Wheat from the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, Institute. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we think a lot about is uh, the job growth and particularly the uncertainty around small business job growth. Mm -hmm. With regulations changing and, and possibly coming down, should we anticipate that while there's still some uncertainty around that, we would see a, a delay between the time when the regulations change and when we actually start seeing stronger job growth among small businesses? I would hope not. Um, a, you know, a lot of the growth will come from anticipation of the changes which are actually likely to happen now. Um, we've sort of seen that in the stock market you know, recently. You know, Trump hasn't been sworn in yet, yet we've seen a significant increase after a, a drop off there for a few hours when people kind of realize, you know, this could be good for the economy and be good for the country. So, so I think 
um, if we keep doing positive things like we just did this week with the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act and HALOs, um, I think small businesses and investors will see, you know, they're serious about it. It's not just talk now. And I think that a lot of that, the opposite of that, the overregulation, uh, Dodd-Frank, Obamacare, and the rest um, have held the economy back. So I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to see a lot of growth in the right direction. Let's move one row forward. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, Kitty Wang with New Tang Dynasty TV. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about um, that a few days ago, President elect Trump met with the Chinese uh, e commerce uh, founder of the Alibaba, uh, Jack Ma, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, they discussed about the plan to create 1 million jobs for the U.S. small business and middle sized uh, business to selling through the e-platform. So how do you think about this plan? Do you think it's realistic or just uh, some deep service? I think it's huge. And, <laughs> and, and uh, I, I'm, I think it's very positive. <coughs> and, and I think it shows that to some degree, uh, during the campaign, there was some rhetoric on both sides that doesn't necessarily uh, jive with the policies that we're going to see down the road. If what was said and what actually will work are inconsistent with each other. Now, I mean, I think for, for example, on immigration, I think we're gonna strengthen our immigration. And, and there's a lot of us that think that illegal immigration is bad. Um, but overall, immigration for this country is good and important and it just needs to be controlled. And I think on trade, it's, it's the same thing. I'm a, I'm a strong uh, uh, free trader and, and voted for you know, a whole range of, of free trade agreements. But I think the way that ultimately they were enforced by the administration, I would say not just the current administration, but previous administrations, they didn't look out enough for Amer American businesses, especially small businesses. And when we say business, we mean uh, the, the workers and employees too. And, and I think Trump uh, understands that intuitively, um, how important all of this is that we get it right because it affects jobs and those people that hold them or don't hold them and their families. So, so I, I think that's one sign of, of him acknowledging that, uh, that, you know, it's a big world out there. The United States has to play an important role in it and trade's going to be part of that and, and China's going to be part of that. You know, they, they're obviously a, a rival to some degree on the international scene and then you've got islands being built out in the South China Sea and now militarized and, and you know, the Taiwan across the Taiwanese Straits is always a problem and, and a challenge. Um, but I think we can do those things and also get trade right, which will be ultimately, I think, benefit uh, both countries. Let's move over here, okay. uh, all the way on the right, the first row. Let's wait for the mic. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Tom Sullivan with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, their small business program. Congratulations on bill passage yesterday. Thank you. Um, I had a, a statement and then a question. So the statement uh, is that once that bill, the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act, uh, gets signed into law, I would encourage the committee to schedule regular oversight hearings so that your intentions to help the regulatory process for small business actually come to fruition because it's as you know, uh, sometimes when the laws are passed, the implementation suffers a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the question I have is, you've got a, a great group of um, small business stakeholders in this room. Uh, what would you like from us to get the bill passed in the Senate to the President's desk? Yeah, well, on, on, the, uh, on that, that's, uh, the, the Senate is always a challenge on, on, on anything, um, but, I would just urge you uh, to let your folks at the grassroots level stay in touch with folks that uh, that we'd have a chance at actually moving. I mean, somebody like, uh, I'm Ohio, Sherrod Brown, he's really liberal, and you can talk to him and he'll smile at you, and, and I like Sherrod a lot, but actually getting his vote is going to be challenging on virtually anything the chamber wants. Um, there's a whole lot of folks that are up for re-election uh, this coming time in, for lack of a better term, red states, who I think are going to want to do things which are going to show that they understand job creation and how important 
American businesses are in this, especially small businesses, because small businesses are, you know, they like to beat up on the corporations, you know, uh, but, but small businesses, everybody loves them, or they, they act like they do. So I would strongly uh, encourage the chamber and, and NFIB and all the other groups to figure out where it's going to make a difference, where you got a shot at it, and focus your attention uh, there. That, that would be my advice. Let's move one chair over. Oh, in the oversight, uh, we definitely intend to do that. We actually just uh, just hired a new uh, attorney there who who uh, did oversight uh, uh, for the House Oversight Committee, uh, the uh, uh, with the Appropriations Committee, and a number. She's great, and uh, so we're we're strengthening and beefing up that because even though we have a a Republican administration, we think oversight is just as critical who's ever uh, in, in power. Yes. Thanks so much for your good efforts on mm -hmm. behalf of small business and <coughs> entrepreneurs. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned both initiatives passed with Excuse significant. Could you, could you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> John Chisholm uh, from San Francisco. Uh, you mentioned that both initiatives are passed with significant margins, mm -hmm. bipartisan. Um, I'm sure when you're writing the legislation, you're always thinking, could we put this in? Could we put that in and still get it passed? Mm -hmm. Given the fact that you did have these healthy margins, are there additional amendments that you can envision uh, uh, perhaps introducing to further strengthen uh, either uh, piece of legislation? Yeah, we're looking at that now, and our staff is considering, uh, you know, what, what the Senate staff and others over in the Senate might like to see that if we end up in conference or whatever happens. You know, we don't know if they're going to pass the identical bill, whether we'll have an opportunity. Um, but we're always looking to make bills better, understanding that as we get bills that I might like more, we may lose folks over in the Senate side, and we need 60 over there, which means even if we have all the Republicans on our side, we need eight Democrats. And and uh, so that, but yes, we're, and, and we would welcome input on that also. I've got some of my crack staff back there too, so, and they'll probably be around afterwards, so if you have some things you'd like us to uh, consider including, we're, we'd be happy to do that. Let's do one last quick question right here, second row. This one is not allowed to include a statement because we only have a couple of minutes left. So, I'm Francis Skrobyshevsky. Um What I'm concerned about is what I would call stealth regulation, and that's not an obvious regulation, but it's things like the International Energy Code that now applies in local jurisdictions. So they adopt the International uh, Code, and then we're subject to people who are renovating buildings, as I'm doing, I'm renovating a 250-year-old building that was owned by a member of the Continental Congress. I have to cover up all the old hand-hewn beams because I have to meet Energy Code requirements. Mm -hmm. And this is regu regulation as well. It's costing me tens of thousands of dollars. And uh, you know it's not a federal regulation, but it's something that's been adopted locally. Similarly, locally, you have local codes that impede commerce, and you know these things need to be addressed as well. The range of regulatory impact on small businesses is just overwhelming. It's, mm -hmm. it's, so these things also have to be addressed in conflicting regulations. I'm in a historic district, so I have to comply with ADA requirements in places in a 250-year-old building, for example. Mm -hmm. So these things also need to be addressed and are not obvious. Okay, uh, that's, we're always looking for topics of interest uh, in the Small Business Committee, and that's one we actually haven't had a hearing on in the two years that I've been there so far as chair, and, and it's something, again, my staff's back there, so we'd like to follow up and, and perhaps have one on that. We had them on, on drones uh, one time, so we're looking for things that are, that are interesting that we may not necessarily think of as small business issues. But our jurisdiction is so broad. I mean, we talk about Obamacare, you know, tax reform, uh, and international th 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 things on, on the way. So uh, we're, we're open to talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've done a really good job on time here. Excellent. Um, good deal. Thank you very much for coming. Thank, for thank you. Good to see questions. everybody. Thank you.